Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, there's been a lot of uh, talk about what are the next steps. So I know that JFN is going to be putting together a report, and we can work on that. There is uh, a peer network of, uh, of uh, 16 funders, and we welcome other funders to join us to help move this issue forward. Uh, it's a privilege of mine to introduce our next speaker. Isaac Herzog has been a member of Knesset since 2003. The son of the former Israeli president, Chaim Herzog, he was born in Israel and rose to the rank of major in the IDF before entering civilian service. In 2005, he was first appointed to a cabinet position in the government as Minister of Housing. And in March of 2007, he was appointed Minister of Welfare and Social Services, which is where I got to know Bougie through our foundation's partnership with the Israeli government and the JDC, Israel Unlimited. In that role from 2007 through his second term in 2009 and until earlier this year, he accomplished so much in the economic and social spheres. His many achievements include significant development in the areas of children at risk, promoting the inclusion of people with disabilities in the workforce, enhancement of the quality of life of the elderly, a reform in the services offered to Holocaust survivors, and the reinforcement of the social safety net. He has since resigned his position as a cabinet minister and continues to serve as a member of Knesset for the Labor Party, serving on the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee and the Law and Constitution and Justice Committee in the Knesset. Bougie has done so much for our community and is a real believer in the importance of this work. It gives me great pleasure to introduce member of Knesset, Isaac Herzog. So, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I think we had a very exhilarating and exciting day. I want to thank you, Jay, wholeheartedly. I want to thank the Shira, the, Ruderman, the Ruderman family, the foundation. I think uh, it was a huge honor for me to attend an event which Jay held at his home uh, a week before uh, his father, Mort, Alava Shalom, passed away with Mort at the event. and. Uh, uh, it was a vote of thanks for the incredible work which the Ruderman family does in Israel. I want to thank all the members who have taken part in this event and to tell you that I believe that whilst the world is looking for new revolutions, whether it's uh, Occupy Wall Street or Otsuel Boulevard, we're seeing a revolution in front of our eyes in recent years which I believe is an evolution, actually, but evolution which leads to a major revolution, which is the inclusion of people with disabilities in all spheres of life. Yes, Tim Schreiber pointed out to us the setbacks as well. We know them. But nonetheless, I definitely, out of deep conviction, believe that we are seeing a, quite a substantial leap ahead in the story of people with disabilities worldwide. I can add and say to that that... There, if you believe, and I feel, and I see, and I meet parents and family members, and of course, social activists and NGOs and so forth, who believe in transforming the life of people with disabilities to things that were never dreamt before. I have seen people with mental uh, uh, retardation, or as you say, disabilities, uh, cognitive disabilities, going to the academia, uh, programs which we have... Uh, enhanced and developed together with universities. It was mentioned by Mrs. Zuskind that uh, there are soldiers in the army that Akim manages to uh, mobilize to the army and it's one of the most exciting moments that you see when they are mobilized. And we are talking about a large array of developments including on the daily life, in school, at work, in, uh, uh, with uh, housing, uh, I've seen the booklet of JDC, the Center for the Independent Living is a fabulous organization uh, to promote independent living and I know that other entities who are represented here are working and advocating such as Bizchut, uh, independent living of people with disabilities. What I wanted to focus on, the name that, that the, the word that was mentioned constantly here was dignity. And in fact, we are talking about dignity. But the real result of this process is actually a major social result, which is to take people with disabilities from uh, poverty, from duress, from terrible circumstances of life, and give them a full, satisfactory life 
with reward. And the stories are immense. I visited a plant of the Fishman Group, which was outstanding in Rishon Lezion. All of the employees in the plant are deaf, 120 of them. The plant supplies a very delicate and important uh, item to the military. The management, which uh, is not uh, uh, with disability, has learned to work with the employees so sign language, and all managers are co compelled to speak sign language. It speaks for itself. And I believe these are wonderful examples of how a combination of business, social entrepreneurship, NGOs, foundations, and government can develop all sorts of fascinating venues of including people of, with disabilities in all spheres of life. One of the challenges of this current era is social enterprises, meaning private business going into enterprises which, on the one hand, benefit them, but not necessarily for profit. Such an example I've seen recently with another group in Israel, the Ariel Group, whereby they came to a joint venture also with the government on the issue of what we call a community, ecologic, ecological community. For example, the recycling of products from the computer and technological world. For example, taking old computers, breaking them apart, making it a business, and, and, and recycling the products again, which seems to be a very attractive new venue for people with disabilities. Call centers. I uh, can tell you that in call centers throughout the world and in Israel, the employment span is about nine months. You're talking about students. The students move on. However, people with physical disabilities, once they're hired to call centers, uh, have a very long and sustainable and enjoyable career. One such center is called Kol Yachol. It's uh, playing with words, but it means call, calling, and Yachol, you could do it. And, so, so, and now today, many new call centers are coming forth and employing people with disabilities. Um, new developments that I've noticed recently, people with Asperger's syndrome. Asperger's syndrome requires only, you can't have multidisciplinary or multitasking with people with Asperger. However, they have an innate quality uh, in, the, sir, in, the, in the industry of um, scanning. And uh, people have identified it in Israel and have created a scanning industry for insurance and banking where they hire and employ people with Asperger. And so forth and so on. It's endless. But it's a social revolution because this revolution enables people to earn and to make a living. And here, that's where I'm proud that I had the opportunity of making the revolution on behalf of the government. Up until the last few years, a person with disabilities enjoyed disability allowance of, less, of about $500 a month, and that's what he would live off. If he earned anything above that, Social Security would be taken off. And I've legislated the most revolutionary bill in this sense, which enables people with disability both to receive the allowance and to work and earn with no limitations. And that's what has brought the change now, with thousands of people being uh, starting to cross the ocean, starting to cross the fears of going out of home and entering the business world and working from the law firm to the industries. And the real role of government now should be to continue pushing for further employment of people with disabilities. And I may add that I think this calls for a private-public partnership with foundations, with NGOs, to find various venues of inclusion of people with disabilities in the workforce. Because as much as we would like government budgets to finance the social needs of any society, as we are very much aware of what happens around the world, the real solution to a lot of these challenges should be the capability of people with disabilities to earn, make a living, and get the bread out of the earth, as we say in the Bible. So I wish all of you um, that we meet again in the future with new ideas, innovations, 
joint ventures and partnerships that would enhance the life of human beings and give them the same taste that we have. Thank you very much. Please welcome to the stage Andres Spokoini, President of the Jewish Funders Network. Thank you. Um, and uh, what we heard today about deafness uh, actually made me think of a, of a story, of a Jewish story that deals with deafness from a different perspective. So a rabbi is teaching a class, and in the background there is a baby crying. And uh, all his students are so concentrated in the text that do not hear the baby cry, and they keep on st uh, studying. So the rabbi looks sort of dazed and, and, and then angry and then sad, and finally he stamps the, his fist on the, on the table and says, I don't know what you're studying, but if he doesn't, if he, if he doesn't let you hear the sound of somebody crying is not Torah. You've been studying the wrong thing. Now, this was an amazing day. I mean, we, we talked about networking, about sharing, about collaborating, about inclusion, about partnership. But as we learn, as we become more sophisticated, let us remember why we are really here. We are here to hear those cries. We are here to hear them with more force, because we are, after all, those that we started to hear them when the world was largely deaf to them. But we need to keep hearing the cries of those that go through life without being able to develop their full potential. And we actually need to make so that the entire Jewish community is aware of those cries. This day was very rich. I, I personally learned a lot. I met a lot of new people, a lot of new faces. It was also a little messy, I mean, but processes like that, that involve a lot of partners building something new, are always messy. So I'm not worried about that. As Walter Benjamin once said, the storm we see around us, we call progress. And today, we made a lot of progress. Most people that I met today, and that, that, that's really new, especially in the Jewish world, unfortunately, came here to listen more than to talk, to share more than to own, and to learn more than to teach. Generally, we listen to others just patiently, waiting for our turn to respond. Today, we listen in order to understand. So each funder in this room is making incredible strides toward inclusion, towards a better quality of life for people with uh, disabilities, with disabilities. I love that term. Um, and JFN is proud to be a partner in catalyzing your individual philanthropy through convenings like this one. Hosting the peer network uh, of funders of uh, disabilities and special, uh, and special needs that formed actually last year, at last year's advance, is particularly important to me and to the leadership of, of JFN, which I represent. The network helps each of the members to explore their own philanthropy more deeply through exchanges with peers. But this network will also lead you, a community of funders, to build a field that focuses on shining a light of Jewish life and learning, independent living, jobs and family support for people with disabilities and their loved ones. But learning and reflection is really not enough. Uh, Jay just spoke about next step. And I want to end this day with a call to action. This field needs leadership. It needs practical ideas that work to shape thinking, create expectation, and build an evidence base. Big ideas that ultimately anchor this community of funders here today and magnify the individual work that each of you does. So I challenge you, I challenge all of us, as a community of funders, as we finish this momentous day, to think together and engage in collective action for the development of the field. As we hear the cry, as I said before, we need to make sure that everyone in the Jewish community hear it, hear it as well. There are many things that a community of funders we can do. There are just some examples. Uh, could we have, for example, a silver ribbon that we give 
to synagogues, JCC, and summer camps that actually achieve excellence in their integration of people with uh, disabilities in their facilities and programs, like the Blue Ribbon for School Excellence. I think we could. Could we have forums like Breakthrough Philanthropy that, P that Peter uh, Tile runs? Uh, can our community host similar series of events in which we discover, recognize, and support the big ideas that can change the Jewish world for people with disabilities? I think we can. Can our community of funders create centralized list of resources from medical help to home care, from Jewish education to, uh, to job search for people with uh, disability, something like an Angie's List or a TripAdvisor? I think we can, and I think we should. The Human Rights Campaign Foundation, the nonprofit arm of the nation's largest advocacy group for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender, uh, and, and transgender American, has launched with the Schusterman Foundation, the Jewish Organization Equality Index. I have to write it down because it's so long. 500 organizations, JFN included, have been asked to complete a survey evaluating the LGBT inclusivity in our employment policies and practices, as well in our programming and outreach. Could we have the same integration index for people with disabilities? I think we could, and I think we should. So this is the challenge to all of us. We are a lot of people in this room. Each of us will have great ideas, good ideas. Share them. Send them to me. Send them to JFN. Send them to the people you've been working with today. Inclusivity is not something we, does for, we do for others. Inclusivity makes us all stronger, and we are committing to pursue this. So come work more and more closely on this issue. Join the peer network yourself. And if you don't, connect with the peer network. Learn what they are doing. Share. Um, let us all learn from what you are doing. JFN is committing to help you launch a field-building breakthrough initiative in the next year. Share with us what you think, because we can't wait to get started. Always remember that what we can conceive, we can achieve. Let me finish by another story. Uh, this is something I learned in my work in East Europe. I see there Steve, my, for <laughs> my former boss, so he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, um, a man goes to buy a car in Russia, in the Soviet Union. And you know how, you, how, how it works. You go, you go buy a car, you place the order, you pay, and then you wait for 10 years. So a man does the whole thing, goes to the DMV of Moscow, uh, files his uh, request, pays, and the clerk tells him, okay, come back in 10 years. And then he says, uh, in the morning or in the afternoon? He says, the clerk looks at me, what does it matter? It's in 10 years. No, I'm asking you because in the morning the plumber is coming. So, <laughs> I, now, if, if we are going to wait 10 years, if we are going to wait 10 years, it really won't matter. We don't have 10 years. The people that are crying out there don't have 10 years. So, we need to act, and we need to act fast. So to start this conversation about what we can do, um, let me welcome the members of our closing panel. Felicia Herman, Executive Director of Natan, Steve Schwager, Executive Vice President of the JDC, Barry Schreg, President of CJP, of the Boston Jewish Federation, and Susan Stern, National Campaign Chair for the Jewish Federations of North America. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. What you're going to hear me is coughing. Since I got here this morning, I've developed a cough. <laughs> I apologize. Um, thank you, Andreas. I'm truly honored to be here representing the Jewish Federations of North America, a partner of this conference, as we help to lay the groundwork for this exciting, challenging, and inspiring work uh, that lies ahead on behalf of Jews with special needs. This has been a remarkable day, I think, for all of us, inspiring in so many ways. Uh, to Jay Ruderman and the Ruderman Foundation, thank you for your inspiration for the groundbreaking work that you're doing. 
uh, Jewish Funders Network for convening all of us. We really, really thank you. Um, our conference today has really been a little different. We're not asking for you to open up your checkbooks, although we always, we won't mind that. But we're talking about opening up your homes, your hearts, your schools, and your synagogues. And that's really a very different level of commitment. All of us in this room have had an impact on this issue, but this is far too big, as everyone has said, for any one agency or foundation or any one network to solve. It's going to take all of us, the funders, the agencies, the parents, the families, government officials, professionals, and planners to ensure that this issue remains at the forefront of our awareness. We in this community, the Jewish community, should be leading the way. We should be the model of an inclusive community. So we're here, all of us here, because we care. But most of all, we're here because we know we can and we must do better. We're here because we need to move this topic to the top of the Jewish agenda. And so I am privileged to have this wonderful panel, and um, uh, Barry and Steve and Felicia, all of whom are uh, um, experts in, in this area in terms of moving agendas. We have each had different experiences in moving big ideas in the communal agenda. Innovation, next generation, camping, renewal. Personally, I was involved in the very first pilots for Birthright um, and Israel Experience. So today I'm going to do a little crowdsourcing. You're my crowd here about how we can move this cause of being more inclusive and better serving people with disabilities. In the framing that Andreas just did in his call to action, he challenged this audience to come up with some big ideas to move this field. So as we answer the questions in the next few minutes, um, I want you to think of some powerful examples of successes and examples from your own work of how some of these big ideas have moved issues um, to the top of the agenda at your respective organizations. So let's begin. We all know the current communal focus on innovation and peoplehood and identity. What can we learn from these trends? Can each of you give me one or two concrete suggestions for, for what funders in this room can do to leverage those trends in order to increase the attention and support for people with disabilities? And Barry, I'm going to start with you. Um, it's a huge honor to uh, be here and to be uh, working with all of you on this. Um, I am no uh, expert. You are all the experts, uh, not me. I'm just the facilitator for your expertise. So I think that there's a huge lesson. So first of all, I don't think we're really talking about innovation. I don't think that's necessarily the issue. And the best example of that out of the area of Jewish identity is birthright. Birthright's not an innovative idea. We've known for 40 years that a trip to Israel can change the lives of everybody who goes through it. The innovative philanthropy in this was about figuring out a process to make this happen. It wasn't about what we ought to do. We've always known what to do. We know what to do about most things. The question is, how do we organize the resources and the people and the, and the power and the energy to make it happen? And that's quite a different quite a different story. And birthright's a good example. It didn't start with the federations. You know, it started, the federations were part of it, couldn't have happened without the federations, but it happened with some philanthropists who said, God damn it, we're losing a whole generation and we're not going to let this happen. And they said, I don't care who's with us or who's against us, we're going to push this thing over the line and make it happen. And I think similarly when we're thinking, look, we were talking about this at the Council of Jewish Federations. Somebody just reminded me, 40 years ago, we had major planning programs on what federations ought to do about disabilities. And, and it went. We had some programs. Cleveland was one of those communities that was pushing this thing. And then it disappeared from the agenda for a number of years, although many federations were still continuing to push it. But it, it, it sort of disappeared. We just can't afford to let this thing disappear. And the ultimate possibility here is really similar to the birthright thing. The combination of federations and um, uh, major philanthropists, uh, foundations, pulling that stuff together to put beginning resources on the table, federations don't have a lot of unrestricted money left. We just don't. We have unlimited ability to bring people together in networks from major foundations to make unbelievable, terrific things happen. But then the core of what a federation is has to move from gaining the next unrestricted dollar to making amazing things happening happen by partnering with foundations that share a common vision that will move the Jewish community into the future. That was the beginning of the process that the Ruderman family brought us into. 
along with many other foundations, and the potential, as you can see, is unlimited. From the beginning, which was a process of talking about Jewish education with another foundation, to moving to a conversation about disabilities to, with the Federation and with others, to moving to a conversation about Jewish education and disabilities, and then now to uh, the broader field of disabilities and employment. One step at a time, new partners coming in all the time. Thank you, thank you. Felicia, your thoughts on that? Uh, well, first, I'm, I'm very honored to be here and feel very much like the small fry at the table. Um, that uh, Natan, I don't know if everybody even knows what Natan is. It's a network of young philanthropists located primarily here in New York uh, that funds uh, innovative emerging nonprofits around the world. And uh, our connection to this, to the topic of today, is uh, among our grant areas is a grant committee that we call Advancing Inclusiveness in the North American Jewish Community, and one of the organizations that we're proud to support, Matan, uh, Dori Kirshner is here today. Um, but we, I think the reason why I'm here um, mm -hmm. is not because I have the biggest wallet uh, at the table, but um, rather because what Natan represents is a new generation of funders uh, funding a new generation of organizations. And I would say that from my experience, the, you know, all of the buzzwords that you just mentioned, peoplehood and innovation and identity, are I think just frames, kind of building off of what Barry said, they're just frames of discussing the th same things that we've been discussing all along. And I think that the, the key to bringing the disability conversation to the forefront of the communal conversation is just integrating it into all of those other conversations. So saying that there is no Jewish communal conversation that shouldn't in some way include the conversation about disabilities. Um, I think actually that, um, I'm glad that Andres brought it up, a great case study for this is how the conversation about GLBT issues has really changed in the past few years, gays and lesbians, bisexual, tra transgender, and I think actually that that's in no small part, it's particularly relevant today, um, be it's due in no small part to the uh, power that the Schusterman Family Foundation has wielded so strategically and well in, around this issue, really bringing it to the fore. And I think about it in, the, in terms of the way that that issue has sort of morphed in its history in Natan. So we started funding Keshet, which is now one of the leading GLBT organizations from Boston. Um, started funding Keshet many years ago with a very small grant that I would characterize as a, as a justice grant, sort of a, a combating discrimination grant. As we started thinking about that kind of inclusion, though, we realized that inclusion more generally was something that was important to us as a foundation, was something that we wanted the rest of the community to know that we cared a lot about. Um, and so we started a whole committee devoted to inclusion, which now funds a portfolio of different issues under the general heading of inclusion. And the final stage, though, I think is the most interesting, um, because the final stage is now we are making our final grant decisions for this year, and we are funding or considering funding GLBT issues across almost all of our major grant areas. So not just inclusion, but also our kind of Jewish identity area, and also in our peoplehood area. And this, I think, is, is what I would, you know, to go back to how I started, it's saying that this is an issue that can be integrated into every funding area and any communal conversation is, I think, the, the sort of expansive way that we as funders need to be thinking about it. It's not, not just pigeonholing it as discrimination or inclusion or even education, um, but that it really has something to say to all of these issues. Interesting. Steve. Um, first, uh, first I want to say we have to get over our defensiveness and we have to, we have to not be so down on ourselves that, uh, that we can't accomplish anything. If you take a step back and look at what's happened, much has happened in this field, as Bougie said and others have said. The, the key here is we can't go it alone. None of us individually can do this alone. We need partners, we need funding partners, and we need people to challenge us all the time. In, in, in the case of uh, JDC, the Rudiman family came to us and challenged us. Challenged us not only verbally, but challenged us with money. And we then t took the Rudiman's money and went to the government and asked them to match. 
And in most of JDC programs, we leverage donors' money four and five to one. The trick is to be able to give up some ownership of the project, to accept the funders as your partners, and to do challenge grants, to challenge us to do better all the time. And candidly, I mean, what, what the Ruderman family gift did to us is forced us to think about disability more than just for children, but to begin to think about disabled, disabled as a group in Israel. And it led us to create centers for, for livings, for disabled to live independently. It led us to look at all of our employment programs to make sure that they encompass the disabled. So I guess what I leave you with here is the fact that we need to be positive, we need to be proactive, we need to share, and we need to challenge each other to do better. Um, Felicia, Natan, I don't know if all of you know, it's really a gathering of young people primarily, 40 and under, some of them are getting a little older than 40. Um, and so it's a very exciting way to bring new young people into the area of philanthropy, but into lots of new areas. And I agree with Barry that disability should not be considered an innovation. It's, a, it's an important part of our community, and we have to look at it that way. But I'd like to know, Felicia, if the lessons that you may have learned, because you have been doing really innovative programs and, and funding very, very interesting um, uh, Jewish organizations and programs. Um, so being at the forefront of that movement that can help people in this room, what can you do to help people in this room play a similar role with respect to what we will hope will be a movement, not an innovation, but a movement that we really have to move this forward to um, help fund programs for people with disabilities. So I think, what, I think what we're talking about here is why innovation now is a word that's everywhere. It's included yeah. a track at the GA and it's become a real buzzword, whereas a few years ago that was not the case. And I think that whether you think it's a good or bad thing, you can either blame us or you know, hold us responsible or <laughs> give us some, a little bit of responsibility for, for the use or overuse of that word. Um, and so when I, I'm thinking back onto how that came to be, and first I don't want to pretend that it was any kind of strategy that we came up with from the beginning. So I want to give everybody permission to not have a strategy right now, but to let things evolve and to recognize smart things as they come up and to sort of run with them when, you know, to be opportunistic. But I, I think about this as, you know, if we're starting out right now, then we, then we realize that what we're trying to do is create systemic change. Um, there are many strategies for doing that. And again, I really think that the GLBT issue is a, is a great case study for this. And so in thinking about how, what to say today, I uh, was talking to my friend Adam Simon, who's a, a program director at the Schusterman Family Foundation, and he put it really well. He said that um, what we're talking about is elevating an entire conversation in a comprehensive way through all of the levers we have at our disposal. So what are some of the levers that funders have at our disposal? Number one, we can fund, of course, best-in-class organizations. For Natan, that means always bringing new organizations into our funding portfolio, always seeking out uh, high-quality new ideas, always being open to change, and also staying committed to organizations that we think have the most potential for systemic change for the long term. So both looking, bringing new things in all the time and sticking with your real winners over time. Of course, again, it's sort of humbling to sit here. For us, over time means like eight years, but you know, that's, that's <laughs> progress. Um, uh, second, I think we really, uh, in not just funding best-in-class organizations, but finding some of them who can be real organizational partners for you as a funder, um, that can become an extension of what you do and inform what, you're do what you are doing, inform your thinking, and also be your legs and your ears on the ground in the field. For us, in all of this innovation work, that partner really has been Jumpstart, which is an organization in Los Angeles um, that uh, calls itself a thinkubator for Jewish innovation. They're the ones at every conference. They're the ones advocating. They're the ones doing the research. And our work in the field would be nothing if it were not for them and the partnership that we have. Another thing I would say is that we're not just thinking this day and age in particular, we need to not just be thinking about funding organizations, but also funding networks. So here we are at Jewish Funders Network, a network of funders, and that's one kind of network. Another way to think about this is to think about funding networks of organizations because no one organization can actually accomplish this enormous task ahead of them on their own. 
other tools at the funders at a funder's disposal using your bully pulpit to advocate for ideas and approaches for organizations for leaders that you believe in for us this just meant getting out of our own office and speaking and writing more on the issues that meant the most to us and the organizations that we most believed in <coughs> i keep i think the schusterman foundation should pay me a royalty today but to refer to them again um lynn schusterman when they were working on this issue wrote some op-eds about discrimination against gays and lesbians that were extremely powerful i think and moved a lot of people's thinking on this and then as andres mentioned they started the jewish organizational equality index in partnership with a non-jewish organization the human rights campaign to really now force organizations, Jewish organizations, to think about GLBT inclusion at all, at all times. And finally, I would say that the position of a funder is really unique. If you're on the ground in a particular organization, it's very hard to look up. But the position of a funder really gives you the opportunity to see the issue from 30,000 feet. And from that uh, vantage point, you can see out there what does the landscape look like, like, what does exist, what doesn't exist, what can we bring in from the outside world into the Jewish community, where are there holes, where are there existing institutions that needed to be, need to be upgraded, where are there new leaders and entrepreneurs whom we can empower. And finally, I think today is a great example of the power that funders can have in terms of convening all of the important stakeholders around a particular issue and defining a sector, calling it out, putting money into it, and then issuing the challenge to the rest of the funding community to do something about that now as well. Terrific. Thank you. Oops, I had to turn this off. I'm sorry. Um, Barry or Steve, do you have any thoughts on... Uh... Okay. I don't have to go. So um, I think everything that you just said is actually right on target. I mean, for me, the question is, you know, how do we, I just see so much potential in federations. Even as many federations are having problems right now, it seems like the campaigns are deteriorating, still federations have huge potential. We still raise more than almost anybody else, and probably more than anybody else in the Jewish community. We have networks that include all the key players and all the key foundations. And the question is, can we be worthy of all the power and energy that we have? You know, so it, what we're trying to do, so we were, I think we were probably nearly as early in funding the GLBT stuff in, in Boston because, you know, people said, why are you doing it? And I said, guess what? We can't afford to lose a single Jew. I mean, it, you know, it wasn't about anything except, except the, the power that, what the vision of the Jewish community is, that everybody's got to have a place at the table, that, that this is a, a big, beautiful culture that we represent that, that has the power to change the world and we're not going to betray the trust that we have, that people have in us. So I think on the one hand, so we're funding all kinds of stuff through uh, present tense and we're looking for innovation. And on the other hand, you know, the major foundations in town are also working very closely with us and trying to come up with the, the next round of things that place us at the leading edge of Jewish history. The point I'm making is, is that if federations can't do that, these days they actually have almost no other role. Because you're gonna, because the donors are going to continue to say to us, if it's just a question of giving money to the same stuff, we can do it ourselves. We can make those choices. We don't need the federations to make those choices. So we have to show, and we can show, and there's tremendous potential in the movement to show, and JFNA can be a vital part of that. You know, that we can be huge change makers and that we can envision a great Jewish future and move us there, whether it's through birthright on the Jewish um, identity side or day schools, we just came from a conference, or whether it's disabilities. If we can't make major change, then, then there's, a, then there's a, much, a much bigger problem for the federations. In Israel and overseas, we partner with the JDC and we're able to, and with, and with donors, connecting donors to JDC, the stuff that's going on in Israel and in the former Soviet Union, we can, make, we can make stuff happen. So for me, the key question here, if the foundations demand of the federations that they become good partners, and, so, and here's the amazing thing, the more partnerships we have with foundations around special projects, the more money, unrestricted money, we get at the same time. Because if the foundations know that we're their friends and we can work with them on the stuff that most concern them, they also believe that the Federation can actually be a potent force for change. And we learned that and very strongly from our relationship with the Ruderman family and with the other people that were involved in that. 
And, and I think, it's, uh, I think it's, it's helped us with lots of the other foundations in Boston at the same time, and at the same time allowed us to actually make things happen so that even a $50 donor who's making an unrestricted gift also believes that the Federation can be a powerful force. I'm a believer. <laughs> All right, I'm a believer the Federation's a powerful force. The Federations are JDC's longtime funding partners. Um, and as I always say to people, sometimes we have a dysfunctional family and sometimes we have a functional family. But the real, the real issue here is that none of us can afford to be complacent. Good ideas come from everywhere. It doesn't, it doesn't matter where the idea comes from. People have to be willing to speak up, have to be willing to put their ideas on the table, and have to be willing to listen to what the other side is saying. None of us have all the answers in terms of this field. But there is lots of knowledge to be shared. Um, lots, of, lots and lots of knowledge to be shared. JDC had a, had a, has a partnership with the New York Federation around children at risk and, um, and disabled children. And um, when it started, it, there was sort of a fascinating interchange. The Americans sat in the room here in New York, and the Americans said, we know everything about disability. And we're going to tell the Israelis what to do. The Israelis sat on the other side in the room, and they said, we know everything about disabilities. We're going to tell you what to do. Well, the partnership has lasted now nine years. Best practices from both sides have moved across the ocean and made a difference. So the fact of the matter is that the most important thing that needs to happen is we need to be open and talk to each other doesn't always have to be brand new and innovative. It may be brand new and innovative in Israel, or it may be brand new and innovative in Boston. The fact of the matter is there's lots of knowledge out there. And if we can figure out how to share it better and how to be more open with the foundation world and how to challenge each other, we can make this better. So you, I think, Steve, you mentioned that this group here, we have 100 federation uh, people from federations and foundations and 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 uh, from agencies how can this group serve as a catalyst for the larger Jewish community to prioritize this population become more aware and inclusive because this is a force this is an incredible force for good that we're sitting here I sat in those sessions I heard what everybody has to say there's so much energy but how do we use this group because it is much bigger than all of us in this room to to create this force for good and to, to move this up on the uh, agenda for uh, people with disabilities? Look, I think the group needs to come together around three or four themes. And I think once you come together around three or four themes and pull together your funding around those three or four things, you will move the world. People will stand up and say, wait a minute, just as Lynn Schusterman moved the issue on, on gay and lesbian and transgender Jews. Um, she made a statement. She backed it up with her foundation. She brought in, um, she brought in blank. She brought in other foundations, and the world changed. You can make the world change here too. And by the way, the issue is not only in America and in Israel. It's for Jews around the world. <clears throat> so that's what I think. I agree. Yeah, no, I, I, I think, I mean, the question is exactly what's the next important step? Mm -hmm. And, and I, you know, I recall when we were doing this in Cleveland again 30 years ago that um, the then Council of Jewish Federations uh, created a series of think tanks and training seminars to begin getting lots of other federations into this game and making people think about it. Now, every feder most federations have a couple of people in the community who are strong advocates for this. Uh, in the three or four areas that we're talking about, Jewish education, housing, um, jobs, um, 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 inclusiveness, all, all that. But I think that JFNA could actually be in conjunction with JFN, in conjunction with a couple of key foundations, we should be bringing all the federations together. 
we should be, uh, we, it would give a great reason for the foundations in the room from all over the country to put pressure on their local federations to participate, and to come back with a report and to say, what are we going to do on the issue? In other words, there, this is the moment that we should be expanding the reach of this. Look, if it turns out that federations aren't interested, it, it just means that we're just one step closer to disintegration. But my, my feeling is that a lot of federations do want to be part of it. They, they do want to actually make a difference in this area, and we need to bring people together. And JFNA is really in a terrific position to do it. But they're not going to do it without the people in this room putting pressure on. Could I yeah, actually add sure. one thing? Yeah. Um, that I think another important lesson that, uh, that I feel has come out of the sort of universe that we operate in is that it is incredibly important to bring new people to this conversation and new funders in particular, since we're all funders, new funders to the conversation. So every day, right, you have new people who wake up to a diagnosis that puts them now into this universe of families of people with disabilities. So every day there are, you know, there are potential funders of this issue being born. And one of the traps that I think that we fall into is in thinking about only the usual suspects. So, you know, how many times, we try to have a very open door policy at Natana, try to meet with just about everybody. Don't everybody call me for a meeting, but, you know, but we try to meet with basically everyone who wants to meet with us because, especially because we see ourselves as a clearinghouse of information, especially about the funding world, mostly for these new social entrepreneurs, people starting new organizations who have no idea what philanthropy is or what, who they should be talking to. And they all come in with the same three names of foundations that they want to talk to. Do, you know, could you introduce me to the Schusterman Foundation? Could you introduce me to the Bronfman Foundation? We have, we all fall into these traps of, of, uh, barking up the same trees all the time. And if we as funders can think expansively about our own networks of people who are invested in this issue in one way or another, personally, professionally, and try to think about how we bring them to this table as well, then we make that sort of network of, of funding partners and all of the agenda that Steve laid out and that Barry just laid out, we make that a much more powerful approach to solving a problem. I think that's exactly right because the, the truth is maybe, I mean actually you probably have a limited amount of time to meet with people but somehow or other I get calls from everybody every single, like literally everybody every single day. Every conversation provides new opportunities to meet and engage with people um, and you never know what the conversation is going gonna, is gonna to lead to. So over a period of time you really know a, a lot of people at every level and every age group who are deeply connected to this issue by virtue of people in their own families. And if you're willing to, if the federations are, if, if we can use our knowledge of all the people to greatly expand this, that actually is one of the problems. I mean, when people think about major foundations, they think about Schusterman and Wexner and, and you know, all the, and Bronfman and all the usual suspects. The truth is that almost every Jewish community, certainly the larger ones, have, you know, five or six or ten foundations that are probably giving away more money than a lot of those folks are and have deep concerns about Jewish community, Jewish future, and all of them can be kind of brought together around some of these uh, agendas. It's a question of putting the knowledge together and greatly expanding the base. There is, in my view, enough money around to change the future around Jewish education, change the future around disabilities, and set the stage for a Jewish community that actually makes room at the table for everybody so that it's actually worthy of being called a Jewish community at the same time that it strengthens the base of Jewish education and identity. This is the moment for us to do it. Exciting. Um, do either any of you have any final thoughts? I think you've covered, I had a couple other questions, but we've really covered them. Um, any thoughts or suggestions you have for the funders in this audience? Anything that keeps you up at night? <laughs> I'm not going to let you go through all the things that keep you up at night. <laughs> no, I think the, look, I think the issue is that, as I said, you need to find four or five issues come together, be prepared to give up some of your individuality for the Jewish good. Um, and, and heaven knows, as I said before, the issue is not only here and not only in Israel, it's everywhere. Um, I just came back from the Ukraine, um, a place which is, which is horrible for, for those who are disabled. Um, what do they describe the disabled as? They describe them as defective. 
That's the, that's the official term for them, defective. And if you work in this field, you get a degree in defectology. Defectology. And just to give you one quick thought about how difficult it is so that you add this to your agenda, everyone in Russia besides waiting 10 years for a car is entitled to a wheelchair from the welfare ministry. It's an automatic right. You're entitled to the wheelchair. You only have to wait seven years for the wheelchair, 10 for a car. And when you get a standard Russian wheelchair, it's wider than the door frame to your apartment. So basically, you can wheel yourself around your apartment, and that's it. So we have lots to do for Jews, and it shouldn't matter whether it's a Jew here in America, a Jew in Israel, a Jew in Ukraine. We're all one people, and we need to do better for this group of people. Thank you for adding that. Other thoughts, final thoughts? Most important is, you know, don't, don't stop screaming. I mean, yeah, just right. don't stop screaming. Just demand, I mean, that, you know, that we just tell the truth, which is that we just are not going to be worthy of the trust of the community or the trust of Jewish history or the Jewish future. If we don't, if we don't open up, we must, and there's got to be resources in it, and there are partnerships that can happen, and we can make a difference. I learned something from Alexa Yesterday when I saw her being honored and today when she gave the uh, Devar Torah, I learned that she was screaming with her heart and with her face and with everything she had so that she could be part of the Jewish community. And I think that inspires, it inspired me yesterday when I saw you, it inspired me today uh, and, and everyone in this room. So thank you for that inspiration. We won't stop uh, screaming, we promise. Um, I want to thank... Um, did you have any final thoughts? No, okay. Um, I apologize. I want to thank Barry and Steve and Felicia for your thoughts and ideas. Um, I think we've learned a lot. Uh, this whole day we've learned a lot, but I think you've given us a call to action uh, in very concrete terms. Um, and I think that it gives us a direction for our next steps. And I think that uh, this room, with all the power that's in this room and all the heart that's in this room and well, uh, with all the goodness that's in this room, that we will uh, be equipped to make a community intervention, um, the likes of which uh, no community has ever seen. So I know all of us leave here very, very committed. So thank you. And um, I'm now going to, uh, um, uh, one of the things I want to do is to talk about, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I apologize. Um, we're going to now go to our next, uh, to the end of this program. Today we have been inspired and challenged, needless to say, we've been thinking about disabilities in the communal context, but having a disability is obviously a very personal story of an individual and those who love them. So we conclude our conference today hearing from Tom Fields Mayer, author and journalist for more than 25 years, working at People Magazine and the Dallas Morning News, and appearing in the New York Times Magazine and the Wall Street Journal. And Tom is going to share his very poignant story which is told in his book, Following Ezra. So please welcome Tom Fields Mayer. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you all for being here. I, I want to, uh, it's been such an inspiring day and such a, uh, I've, I've learned so much just being here in these few hours. Uh, and I'm honored to be included in this, this group of presenters who uh, have been really, truly remarkable people. I want to thank the uh, Jay and the Ruderman family um, for putting this all together and for including me. Um, I want to thank one other person, Jennifer Mizrahi, who's um, here somewhere, who, who read my book and found that there was a message in it that she thought was, uh, would be of value to this group and helped uh, to make sure that I could be here today to deliver it. So thank you. Uh, so I want to share a little bit of my family's story, and that story uh, s starts one Shabbat morning several years ago my, when my son Ezra was eight years old, and we set out that morning for a walk, and he immediately spotted a neighbor who happened to be quite obese, and Ezra ran right up to this man, and he, said, he looked him over and said, hi, Charlie, why are you so fat? 
So I tried to make myself invisible, <laughs> but Ezra wasn't done. He said, well, Homer Simpson is fat, and Homer Simpson eats lots of donuts. Do you eat lots of donuts? He, wasn't, he still wasn't finished. Ezra's really interested in animals. So he said, uh, well, elephants are fat, and hippos are fat, and panda bears are kind of fat. So when, when we finally escaped, I gave my son the kind of lecture parents often have to give children with autism. That wasn't okay. <laughs> we don't talk about other people's bodies. And I told him, next time that happens, just shake hands and say, Shabbat Shalom. That's how you greet people in our neighborhood on Shabbat morning in Pico Robertson in Los Angeles. Just say, Shabbat Shalom. So I, uh, we practice a lot, but I wasn't sure he had heard any of that until later that day we were again walking in the neighborhood and we ran into another neighbor who also happened to be a bit on the large side. So Ezra ran right up to this man and he said, could you take your hands out of your pockets? And the man did. And he, Ezra shook his hand and he said, Shabbat Shalom. So I felt so proud of my son and of my own masterful parenting. <laughs> and then Ezra turned around and looked me in the eye and shouted, see, I didn't say he was fat. <laughs> so I tell this story for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's just one of my favorite stories about my son. Uh, but I, I, I wrote this book following Ezra about raising my son. It's about a decade raising our son. Uh, the, he's the second of our three sons. And the, the book is full of lessons that all apply not just to parents of children with autism, but to all kinds of parents. And the first of those is a very Jewish idea that comes straight out of the Torah. It says in Mishle, in the book of Proverbs, Chanoch l'na'ar al pi darko, which is a phrase I hope has been repeated here many times. You should, teach, you should teach a child according to his own way. You should teach a child according to the way that child can learn. And you learn as a parent of a child with autism or any disability that the way you would explain something to any other child just doesn't work with a child with autism. So parents and educators need to be creative and responsive and most importantly need to listen to the child and follow the child's lead. And then the second lesson, which even more important to me, that my book and my life are filled with stories in which my son, uh, I, I try to teach my son something. I, as the elder, as the parent, as the source of wisdom, tries to, I try to pass along that wisdom to my son. And in almost every case, Ezra turns the tables on me and he teaches me something and he opens my eyes and makes me see the world in a completely different way. So for example, in my wife and I spent a lot of time in the months after that incident with our neighbor, Charlie, that, uh, trying to explain to Ezra that it's really not okay to, to just say whatever you're thinking about people's bodies, whether those people are bald or have tattoos or uh, uh, might be older and have wrinkly skin. Sometimes he would say, you have wrinkly skin, are you going to die soon? So he had to learn that, that that's kind of refreshing in some ways to be with someone who, who, uh, who who just says what they're thinking. But you have to learn not to. And Ezra did over time. And one afternoon, several months later, I was talking to him. He had just come home from school, and he was talking about some kids fr from school. And he mentioned one particular boy. And I said, oh, I know who you mean. He's the really tall kid. So Ezra started laughing and giggling. And just he, w he was laughing uncontrollably. And I finally said, what? Why are you laughing? And he said, you're talking about his body. So, so who's right? Why is it okay to say someone's tall, but not to say that they're a little bit large? It, it's a lot more difficult to explain the world to your child when the world doesn't make any sense. So, well, the world didn't make a lot of sense to me about 12 years ago. And that was when Ezra was two and a half years old and began displaying some very troubling behaviors. He uh, he would spend long hours on our back porch lining up plastic dinosaurs. That's why there are dinosaurs on the cover of my book. It's not a book about paleontology. Uh, and 
he, he didn't seem to notice other children. He would cocoon himself in blankets, even on very hot Los Angeles days. He seemed to have this need to be, to be surrounded by blankets. And he didn't make eye contact very much. And if you asked Ezra a question, he would just answer by echoing your words. We had such trouble connecting with our son that we sought the help of a family therapist. And my wife and I would go once a week, and we would sit on the floor. And the way this was supposed to work was he was supposed to pick a toy from a shelf. We didn't tell him what to pick. He would choose a toy. And whatever he chose, we would try to take that toy and turn what he did into a social interaction. But Ezra had very little interest in this. And instead of that making it easier to reach our son, it only served to emphasize to us how very different he was and how very remote he was. So one day at the therapist, my wife was in tears, and I was feeling very frustrated, and there was a long silence. And then the therapist spoke up. She said, you need to give yourselves time to grieve. And I said, grieve for what? And she said, you need to grieve for the child he didn't turn out to be. Well, I thought about that. I went home, and I didn't sleep that night. I stayed up all night thinking about that question and asking myself, do, am I having the wrong response? Do I need to mourn to grieve for the child we didn't have, the child Ezra didn't turn out to be? And in the middle of that long night, I decided that no. I didn't have that instinct at all. I had had no preconceived notion of what my children were going to be like. I only knew that I was going to love them. And I wasn't going to mourn for a child I didn't have. I was going to celebrate the child I did have. Well, I'm a journalist, so I, I did that celebrating in the best way I knew, and that was just to pay close attention to him, to watch him, and to listen to him. And the more I did that, the more I came to understand that Ezra had some extraordinary qualities. He loved animals and the zoo, and we began going regularly to the Los Angeles Zoo, just the two of us. And, and before long, he knew the whole zoo by heart. He knew every animal. He knew everything about every animal. Elsewhere, he had these behaviors. He would flap his arms like a lot of children with autism do. And he, he was filled with anxiety. And he would repeat phrases like lines from videos that he watched. He would repeat them over and over. But at the zoo, he didn't do any of that. He was calm and happy. And he would connect with me. He liked the otters and the lemurs. And he liked the order of the place. And I liked being with him. And Ezra loved animation. He loved watching Pixar movies, loved watching Disney movies. He wanted to know everything about every movie. And after a while, he did. He had a calendar in his head of every animated movie he'd ever seen. And then, uh, pretty soon after that, of every Disney animated movie that had ever been produced. He could tell you when it premiered, how long it was, the running time, 89 minutes, 119 minutes. He knew all this stuff about all these movies, and he could recite it to you. This is an important skill in Los Angeles. He <laughs> He, and Ezra had a gift that many, many children lack. He knew what made him happy, and that made me happy. So when he was 12, we were at a cousin's bar mitzvah up in Boston. And Ezra doesn't like big, crowded rooms. He never has. Usually in a situation like that, he would flee. He would go into the lobby and just be by himself. But he didn't. At that party, I, I watched from a distance as Ezra started going up to relatives and strangers and and talking, having little conversations with them. And I wasn't sure what was going on. And so I finally caught up with him to, to find out. And, I, I, and when I did, I heard what Ezra was doing. He would go up to a person and he would say, when's your birthday? And they would tell him. And he would say, oh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs came out on your birthday. <laughs> or Pocahontas came out on your birthday. He was connecting with people in the, through his own passions, through the things that he had in his head, the things that were important to him. And at the time, Ezra was in a school for children with special needs. He had just six or seven kids in his class. But at the time, if you had asked him the names of the kids in his class, he didn't know. 
he would guess. He would say, um, Rachel? David? Like he, like he was guessing. So as I watched my son at that bar mitzvah party, I contemplated the impossibly thin line between what we call ability and disability. The, the same wiring that lets Ezra do these superhuman feats of memory makes it almost impossible for him to do things that the rest of us find quite easy to do. So my book ends with another bar mitzvah. It was Ezra's bar mitzvah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> slightly. Yeah, but not, not too much. So it was Ezra's bar mitzvah, and it was a remarkable day in my family's life. Um, I can hardly do it justice here in a few words. So I hope you'll read my book. I hope you'll buy it for everyone in your family um, and everyone you've ever met. <laughs> It makes a great stocking stuffer for Hanukkah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so a few months before his bar mitzvah, uh, when I sat down with him to, to work on his Devar Torah, uh, and uh, for his Devar Torah, his speech for his bar mitzvah, and we started looking at the Torah portion for that week, and it was Tazria Mitzora. And he said, what a lot of bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah kids have said over many years, and probably a lot of rabbis, I don't want to talk about that. So I said, well, what do you want to talk about? And it took a while, but then he finally told me what he wanted to talk about at his bar mitzvah. He said, I want to talk about me. I want to talk about what it's like to have autism. So, you know, experts will tell you and doctors will tell you that the primary characteristic of autism is extreme difficulty negotiating the social world. But Ezra doesn't think much about that. He doesn't have that social instinct, so it's not that important to him. So at his bar mitzvah, what he explained to the congregation was that autism is really two things. It means that he repeats himself a lot, even when he doesn't mean to, repeats phrases, repeats movements, and it means that he has a very good memory. That's what autism is to Ezra, repeating yourself all the time and remembering things really well. And then Ezra told the congregation something quite profound. He said, sometimes I think all Jewish people have autism. <laughs> we repeat things all the time and we have a very good memory. He said, we sing the same songs over and over. Adon Olam, Shalom Aleichem, Shabbos comes every single Saturday. <laughs> and we have holidays like Pesach and Purim where we will remember things that happened thousands of years ago. How can we do that? We all have autism. So we, we've spent the day here discussing some very pressing challenges in our community and hearing about some creative and innovative programs that are rising to meet those needs and ways that we can do that as we go forward. Twelve years ago when my son was lining up plastic dinosaurs on our back porch, this was really nowhere on the radar of the Jewish community. So. In part, I am here to tell you on behalf of my son and my family how grateful we are that you are all here. But when you leave here, when we all go home to our communities and we take home these conversations and the things that we've been learning are swimming in our heads, let me ask of you one thing. I want you to remember that this all is not about serving somebody else. Today, we weren't talking about someone else's problems. I hope you will remember what Ezra Fieldsmeyer said on that remarkable morning in a chapel in West Los Angeles. All Jewish people have autism. And all Jewish people have special needs. And all Jewish people have reason to celebrate every day what makes us unique and special and valuable to this community. Thank you for listening and, and thank you for all that you do.
Thank you, Tom. Tom will be signing his book at the registration table for anyone who's interested in purchasing it. Uh, I want to thank all our partners, the speakers, the presenters, the facilitators today, but most importantly, thank you to all of you. Today has been an amazing opportunity to learn from each other, but we can't close the door and end our conversations. This can't just be about today, and it can't just be about people with a personal connection to the disabilities world. In all our work as funders, in all our conversations, we need to remember this is about justice and building the strongest possible Jewish community, not just for family and friends with disabilities, but for all of us together. I can't wait to see what we will accomplish. Thank you.